Hello and welcome to the EMS Nation podcast. I'm your host, Faison Arshad. We are launching a very exciting mini series with the folks at AMPA, the Air Medical Physicians Association, and presenting you lectures that were delivered at the CCTMC conference in 2016, uh, this past March in Charlotte. And on the line today, we have Dr. Chris Fuligar, the president of AMPA. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to share uh, all of the wonderful things that we have learned at CCTMC 2016 and looking forward to CCTMC 2017 coming up in the spring in San Antonio. Can you tell us more about AMPA and the Critical Care Transport Medicine Conference, the history, the types of folks that are involved, and the type of content that we aim to deliver? AMPA is the Air Medical Physicians Association, and it's the only physician organization that is dedicated to the practice of air and ground critical care transport medicine. So there really aren't a whole lot of physicians that do what we do across the world. So to be able to have a single organization where we can all come together and call home and learn from each other and collaborate with each other is really the the main focus of AMPA. And as part of our work and in association with the Air and Surface Transport Nursing Association and the International Association of Critical Care Paramedics, we've developed the Critical Care Transport Medicine Conference. The goal of it is to address topics that are pertinent to the pre-hospital and emergency care of the critically ill and injured patients. It's geared towards physicians, nurses, paramedics, respiratory therapists, other allied healthcare professionals, essentially the whole gamut of people that provide critical care transport and medicine on a day-to-day basis. The purpose of the lectures are not only to help to develop the skills that are necessary to perform the job, but also other aspects of what we do, including the development of a leadership skills and to foster collaboration. Today's episode is entitled Pre-Hospital Transfusion and Trauma, What Does the Literature Say? and is delivered by Dr. Michael Jasonbeck. Dr. Jasonbeck has been involved in helicopter emergency medical services for the last 15 years. He's got a lot of experience and is currently the medical director for PHI Aeromedical. He recently moved from the West Coast to Montana and has previously presented at numerous conferences, including the Air Medical Transport Conference, previous years at the Critical Care Transport and Medicine Conference, as well as many others. His talks generally go into the literature and are related to all aspects of critical care, particularly sepsis and a- aviation as well. This certainly is a topic today that is uh, not without controversy, and I think uh, Dr. Jason Beck presents this very nicely. So I think uh, he will challenge your assumptions as he goes through his talk. We certainly hope you enjoy, and certainly tweet us your feedback at AmpaDocs and at EMS underscore Nation. Enjoy. Y'all hear me? There we go. Okay, so, okay. so I looked at the schedule for CCTMC after it came out. There's a lot of stuff on your blood. And I think you're going to hear some different stories and different takes on the literature. And I'm not saying my take is by any means the uh, final word, but I will say that I think the literature is but and I said that last night to a couple of guys, I think, I think we're in a situation now where the literature is not keeping up with practice, and this really becomes a discussion of the nature of truth in medicine and what we should and shouldn't be doing for our patients. So let's start out, who's carrying what? Factor in cells, plasma, all right, so 50-ish percent. Who here experiments on patients? It's the same hand that's I got it. Ah, because the best data we have suggests that we are experimenting on patients. 
That is the best data we have. So let's talk about what the literature actually says about blood transfusion in trauma, specifically in the pre-hospital setting. We will comment on the in-hospital setting as we get there. So I have no disclosures. I would love to have some, but I don't. So, true or false? Hands up for true. Hands up for false. Hands up for it's really buddy and I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here are your randomized controlled trials to lay your hands on and say, this is what I use to base my practice on. All of them. And then there's the evidence. Now, our evidence isn't solid. It is almost exclusively, it is exclusively currently, co cohort trials retrospectively done looking at, you know, this is what happened when we gave blood. And the problem with a retrospective cohort trial is you don't have control over what data gets collected necessarily. You don't have control over what interventions are done. You're not, you're not saying the only thing we did differently for this set of patients is I gave them blood. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that happened that we can't measure, or even if we can measure, we can't measure its exact impact. And that's the problem with the retrospective cohort trial. So, the other problem, the other issue is we have a whole crap load of case studies that say, oh, this is great. And case studies are the main of my existence when I read the literature because you can make case studies say anything you want. Frankly, you can make a retrospective cohort study say anything you want, but it's a little bit harder to publish the raw data. And a lot of these studies don't. But there are 17 case reports. There's a couple in the military, there's a bunch of the military, a bunch of the civilian, and they all pretty much say the same thing. Yes, you can carry blood in the field, and yes, you can administer blood safely in the field. And that's important. I mean, it's, you know, third case reports, this is how we did it, so that's good. And then in the rest of the literature is all these cohort studies I've talked about. And there are basically seven that really address the question at hand. And these are studies that essentially look at, we gave blood, did it now? And that's essentially the question we really want to know. There are some that only exist in abstract form, those are hard to parse out and see what, what the data really means. So we're going to review those seven studies and kind of go over what else there is, what we can glean from that data. There are two studies that looked at pre-hospital transfusion in very specific ways. One looked at as a cause of hypothermia, we won't review that study. And then one published in the bill, I don't know, last week or something like that. Uh, basically looked at the timing of transfusion in trauma patients and implied the earlier the better which makes some physiologic sense. I mean, I think Craig pointed out a great number of really important points. Timing matters. Timing point probably matters. I wish we had the evidence for it. Timing does, I think, matter. All right. So, seven published studies. That's what we're basing delivering blood to our patients in the field. And they're all retrospective cohort. So, Sunita so in 2000, first published study, basically looked at retrospectively the year of trauma data that was done in Tennessee and said, we gave some patients blood, it was a two HEMS programs, one had blood, one had didn't. So we look at 48 patients, and what do we find? There's no mortality difference. We're actually very well matched cohorts, so it's kind of nice, which is a rare thing in these kind of studies where the baseline characteristics of these people, their injury severity score, their revised trauma score, how much volume they got between the between the time of injury and the time of arrival, those were all actually pretty well matched. So this is a decent matched cohort <coughs> in that sense. But the patients that got blood were in the field longer, and they arrived from more acid eye, most likely because it was given pulse. We don't know that, but that's probably the most likely source. Interestingly, in this study, they gave uh, a whole crap load of crystalloids. Everybody got two liters of crystalloids, so that probably didn't help. And the volumes that these two groups got, well, statistically not different, or I think perhaps clinically different, in that the blood group got a liter more than the non-blood group. Maybe that, maybe that excess fluid had something to do with their acidity <coughs> and, and could actually just represent a time marker as well. That's study number one. Not, we would say, the best evidence on the planet. Oh, we call that one. That'd be like Q, like 9F or something like that? I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> so then we jump forward 12 years to the next retrospective study. And this is done in male. And they actually looked at a little bit different question. They transfused everybody. And they compared those that got plasma first 
to those that only got red blood cells. So exactly the question we want to answer, but kind of important and sheds a little bit of light and a little bit disturbing. On the other hand, I'm not sure how disturbed to be when we're looking at nine patients. But anyway, so they looked at plasma first, and nine patients compared to 50 that got red blood cells only. The plasma patients were sicker, took to the anticoagulant. Like, makes sense. You go on scene, you go, holy crap, this guy's been moving. All right, well, let's get the plasma first. Let's not give the red blood cells. They're bleeding, but let's stop their coagulopathy. And so but what we discovered is they had increased mortality. Now, does that mean plasma kills? No. This is a bit of a hyperbole. Don't. Don't come out here telling people that I said plasma kills people. I didn't. It's on my slide, but I didn't say it. No, it's probably a marker for disease. They were sicker. They were anticoagulated. Anticoagulated traumatized patients died with routine regularity. And there's not a lot we can do about it. Hopefully, you know, with maybe PCC in the field, that's a new one. I haven't seen that one. Maybe some of these other things will work. But just realize it's probably a marker for illness, not necessarily that it's a plasma killer. All right, now we get into some good, good-ish data. I wouldn't say any of this is great, but this is probably one of the best studies out there. So O'Reilly looked at Afghanistan, and this is a before and after study. And basically in 2008 in Afghanistan, they went from not having blood far forward to having blood far forward. So if you were blown up in Afghanistan before that, you got all sorts of interventions that you didn't get blood. And after that, you got blood. So he said, hey, this is a great natural experiment. We'll retrospectively look back and say, you know, how many people died before, how many people died after, and be awesome. So they looked at a whole crap load of patients, and what they found is they found 97 patients that they could do what's called propensity matching, and say these patients were pretty much identical to these patients before and after. Other than, the only thing I can say that's different is we gave them blood. <coughs> Actually, it's not really true, but that's kind of what they were trying to do. They're trying to match these patients with one another as best they could. Injury severity score, mechanism, the abbreviated injury score. They were trying to get rid of people that had isolated head injury because those people just don't do well no matter what you do. They are trying to kind of get a cohort of patients that we'd be interested in, right? Multi-trauma patients, badness, bleeding. We gave them blood. Did we make a difference? So the raw mortality is pretty impressive. In the group that got blood, only 0.2% died versus almost 20% in the patients that didn't get blood. That's awesome, right? 50% decrease in mortality, that's, that's great. Well, there were a whole bunch of other differences in those groups. Number one, the mortality was decreasing because of better care over that time frame. Remember, it's a before and after study. So the before people were getting study, getting care, and as we learned, and as we got better at taking care of them, the mortality of all these trauma patients went down. The recipients of blood got twice as much airway intervention. We would suggest that that perhaps is important. They got they were seen in a higher level facility faster. Their transport time was 41 minutes faster. 22% of them got transamic acid, as opposed to zero percent in the in the pre-blood transfusion cohort. So it's kind of hard, you know. And they got way way more blood in the house. It's kind of hard. Did, did the blood matter? Can we say that pre-hospital transfusion decreased this group's mortality? Even the authors say they can't tell. The authors are very honest. This is probably one of the most honest articles I've ever read in medicine. They said, can we publish this? We have no idea. <laughs> no idea. So, I don't know what to do with that. Um, it was a nice try. It was a very nice try. Okay. Now, Joe Hinckley said I once told him once that he thought I never found a study I didn't like, and he may be right. Um, so Brown out of Pittsburgh has published two articles that are optimistic. That's all. They're optimistic. So what they did is they they did another retrospective trial. They looked at this big database. This particular one was not the Blue Grant database. This was their database in, of, of trauma patients that got transfusion versus not. And so basically they had two MEMS trauma patients. One MEMS group carried blood, one did great natural experiment, right? You get all the trauma patients from both groups. You compare them, they should be pretty similar. So they did a whole bunch of things to 
propensity match them, and then do regression analysis to see what mattered, and try to figure out, did this really make a difference? There is an amazing amount of dense statistical wizardry that occurred in this study. I, in all honesty, I will tell you, I don't have the math to understand it quite clearly, but it's not very well described in this study either. What I can tell you is that the claim at the end of this study, and Brown's other study, defies belief, in my opinion. They claim that the administration of an average of one unit of packed red blood cells had a five-fold improvement in mortality. They don't publish their raw data, so you can't really look at the raw data to say, does this matter? Is this a real effect? Were these groups really well matched? I don't know. It's not clear in the study that that was that that's available. Uh, the one thing they did show as well that there was a lower 24-hour red blood cell uh, requirement in their survivors, which, as Craig alluded to, is probably important, but I don't know what it means in this study. This is, you know, these these two Brown studies bother me a lot because they are so optimistic. I don't, I, to me, it defies belief that giving somebody three to five hundred cc's of blood has a five-fold impact on mortality. That's just it's not in the realm of something that I can say it makes any physiological sense. So they look at Holcomb. This is a big study. They looked at kind of the same thing. Hems of blood, hems of not blood, 1,600 patients-ish, you know, 137 got transfused. They didn't do a whole lot of propensity matching. They just looked and, you know, the patients that got blood were, didn't have better outcomes. No matter how you slice and dice the data, you know, they had no change in 24 or 30 day, 24 hour, 30 day mortality. Their acid base status was a little bit different. Uh, they did have decreased use of blood product in the 24 hour period. Is that because the early, you know, early, early mortality kind of breaks that down a little bit? It's hard to know what that means. But up until the time, probably the biggest study said no difference. And then you've got Brown's other study. This is the Blue Grant study. Um, they basically retrospectively looked at data they were collecting for a totally other process. So it's a retrospective cohort data, that's, that's what you're going to do. And you know, hypotensive blood trauma, less than two hours from injury. Uh, they did all sorts of statistical manipulation again. Then they did propensity matching of a subgroup that they don't tell you how they did derive. So of those 50 patients that got packed red blood cells, they picked 35. Probably the 35 that they could match with, with non- uh, transfused, the non transfused group, so they get the best match of cohorts they could. So I suspect that's what happened. They did something called multiple imputation, which means if you don't have a data point, you look at all the other data and say, yeah, we'll stick a data point in there that looks kind of like that other data. Maybe legitimate, but I think when you have to make up 5% of your data, I'm a little bit worried. You know, I don't know what that means. I don't know how much of an effect it has. It may be perfect, it may be dead on. Assume they're dead on. Okay? Assume they're dead on. They didn't brought, present any raw data. They presented all of their data of their retrospective, or excuse me, their regression analyzed data and all that. And they made the following claims. In the unmatched cohort, so 50 versus this, whatever it is, it was 1365. 1 1.3 units of blood per 95% increased odds of death. There is nothing we do in medicine that I know of that confers that odds of survival, that improves your odds of survival. Look at you, do you think anything? I can't think of anything you do that makes that much of a difference. And then in the match cohort, that selected 35, that they didn't tell us exactly how they selected, 1.2 units confer, so less blood converts better mortality. I will be the first to admit they could be dead right. They could be 100% correct. I'll give them that. They could, because I am not the guy who understands regression analyses and all this. But the, reading these articles, it is clear to me they're very optimistic about how blood works in the That's all I will, that's where I'm going to stop. That's where I'm going to stop. And now we have the, the study that was published most recently, this is published in February, probably the largest study to date. And it's a retrospective cohort study done in Vanderbilt. They're looking at 
5,500 patients of which 231 got transfusion. They looked at 24-hour and 30-day mortality, kind of the standard things we looked at. Look at. And they did a bunch of regression stuff too. And they did a subgroup that they said, okay, we're going to you know, pick a subgroup, kind of like around it a little bit, find the group that we can find two matching cohorts and compare them. And no matter how they sliced and diced the data, they could not show any change in mortality in 24 hours or 30 days. And in fact, there is a suggestion, not statistically significant, but a suggestion that there was increased mortality with transfusion. Now that's not positive. It's a little bit disturbing. But the reality is, is that if you have somebody that you're transfusing, they're sick. And the more you transfuse somebody, the more likely the sicker they are. Sicker patients die more frequently than non sicker patients. So it's very, very hard to sort out what this data means. But what I can tell you is we've got seven studies. Two of them are overwhelmingly positive, and the other five are either equivocal or negative. And that's the database from which we're given the blood uh, It's a little bit of a weak database in my estimation. I'm not sure. I, I wish I had Craig's slide up here to figure out what the, what the uh, quality and the, and the recommendation should be. <laughs> I think it's maybe a 2C, but I'm not really sure, at least based on the data. Now, one of my colleagues will commonly say, oh, well, we've got to talk about the risk. Blood transfusion is not benign. Blood transfusion is by no way benign. There's infectious risks. There's inflammatory risks. There are risks. We had hours of discussion in a recent conference call on, you know, should we be giving blood to, how did it go? I don't even remember. It was like RH positive blood. It was crazy. And we, it took us an hour and a half to figure out that we could do it. And it was a question I'd never heard in my career before. So it was a little bit weird. You know, there's transfusion associated lung injury. These are not benign interventions. This is not without problems. Okay? So we don't know if some of this is because they're sick, and some of this is because they've got blood. So, as my friend and colleague will say, well, physiology does not respect geography. So obviously, the next question is, well, we're doing it in the hospital, and if we do it in the field, it must work. Here are randomized control trials of use of blood versus anything else in hemorrhagic shock. That's it. And it didn't look at anything else. It looked at something called polyheme. It looked at 714 patients, compared polyheme to not polyheme. 12 hour resuscitation. So they didn't give, in the, in the polyheme group, they did not give packed red blood cells until 12 hours of resuscitation. That's impressive. That means they resuscitated these people without blood. I'm surprised they got away with it. I'm surprised they're not all in jail. <laughs> because it's the standard of care. Based on a big goose egg of randomized controlled trial. Based on experience, based on consensus recommendations, based on this is the way we've always done it. But there's the sum total of randomized controlled trial data that supports transfusion and hemorrhagic shock. And you know what they found? No difference. No difference in outcome in the 714 patients. <laughs> so, where do we go from here? Well, I, I, when I run into things like this in medicine, I wonder about what we do. I wonder about how we evolved to this point of using very aggressive interventions for a process that we frankly don't understand. And I wonder how the human organism evolved to survive this long, not 20 minutes from the trauma center, not receiving blood transfusion, not receiving crystal blood, and that made it this far. Because the human organism in the last 30,000 years did not evolve 20 minutes from the trauma center. So I suspect we might misunderstand our role in the management of hemorrhagic shock effect. I think Craig may have very much the right of it that our goal is to stop the hemorrhage. But we need to be careful about how we do that. Because I'm not sure that we understand any of that as well as we should. Now, where are we going in the future? So we got some, you know, the good news is anytime there's no data, somebody's finding this data. So that's good. So we got a bunch of trials to look at. Um, the pre-hospital use of plasma and traumatic hemorrhage trial was actually withdrawn in February. 
uh, they were looking at something like 150 patients. They had not started recruiting in. And so, unfortunately, we won't see the results of that trial. But there are several trials out there that are going to help us. Here's the Pamper trial. They're going to look at plasma. So not blood, typically not just red blood cells, but look at plasma. They're going to look at plasma or singing, or gay mortality. They're going to look at a crap load of patients. This will probably be the best database of information we get in the near future. We should see that in a couple of years. That's it. And we'll see if plasma first really works, which is what most of us think. Combat out of Denver we should see next year, which will be nice. Uh, a little bit smaller. They're looking, they're going to truly answer the plasma first question, I think, or at least give us some data on it. Because they're looking at not necessarily plasma versus no plasma, they're looking at the number in which you receive your transfusion. So it's going to be in the, in the plasma group, it's going to be plasma, saline, and not much of it in blood. And then the other group is going to be uh, blood, saline, plasma. So they're actually done. They've actually recruited their 150 patients, and hopefully we'll get some data soon on what that really means to our, to our world. And then there's the pro study, and this is what I think might actually give us useful information. I like pragmatic studies. I like studies that don't try to get down the weeds too much and slice and dice stuff. I like studies that say, we're going to take a huge number of patients and see if our intervention works. So basically, they're just doing a retrospective, uh, or actually they're doing a prospective observational trial. They're collecting data prospectively. They're saying, okay, you people that gave blood to your trauma patients, how they do? And okay, you people that didn't give blood to your trauma patients, how they do? So that would kind of give us an overview answer. And it's going to be really interesting to see what that, what that tells us, what a very large cohort tells us. Because soon thereafter, well, unfortunately not soon enough, in my opinion, we should see Rico. And they're looking at everything. They're looking at the whole free hospital transfusion package. Plasma, blood cell, uh, mac red cells, uh, versus standard care. You're hoping to recruit in the order of 500. It depends on which, which site you go to. 520 or 490, I can figure out what it is. Uh, in three years, they have this bizarre composite outcome, which is a little bit problematic for me. Because they're going to look at in-hospital mortality and or lactate clearance at two hours. And I, I wish they would have perhaps not done that, but uh, so it'll muddy the waters a little bit there. But they're looking at giving, giving us 500 patients worth the data to in April of 2020, which is a little way to it. And hopefully, we'll be able to take some more information. I don't think we're ever going to get the clean, we gave blood versus we gave not, no blood trial. And the reason I say that is, in reading through the stuff, I'll tell you that doing pre-hospital trauma or any sort of trauma research is extraordinarily hard because trauma is not a single disease. And it matters how your injury pattern is. And it matters you know, how you get transported. And there are all sorts of details that you can't control for. So I don't want you to come away with this with A, the plasma kills, OK? So anybody who's in the plasma kills, I need to say that. <laughs> But I don't want you to come away with this thinking that I don't think that blood is the right thing to do. I don't know the answer. I think blood is probably the right thing to do. I think plasma first. I actually think that the field is great and pull it off. I think actually fibrinogen first is going to be the answer. You can answer, depending on the injury factor. But I also think it's important that we all understand that the database from which we're operating to determine that this is what we're going to do is extraordinarily new. And maybe our, our role is really to collect this data so that the next generation has better information to practice on. And do not be surprised. One I open. I won't be surprised if refill shows no difference. If the prospective observation trial shows no difference, I would be very surprised if we can get a trial that shows a major difference in what happens 24 hour, 30 day mortality. Not because it doesn't work, but because it's so damn hard to stop. And that's all I got, folks. All right, folks, that was an unbelievable lecture. We certainly hope you enjoy. What would make us even more delighted is if you would consider coming to CCTMC in person and meeting the entire cast and characters in the following year, in 2017. Chris, tell them all about it.
Absolutely. Um, if you guys would like to join us, we are in San Antonio in 2017. And if you would like to check us out on the website, we are at ampa.org. That's A-M-P-A dot org. Uh, we have also put this together in association with our partner or organizations, the Air and Surface Transport Nursing Association, as well as the International Association of Flight and Critical Care Paramedics. So if you guys are able uh, to come to meet us all, uh, we have a great group of people that all care very deeply about critical care transport and medicine. And I hope to see you in San Antonio in um, the spring of 2017. The best speakers, the best pre-hospital content. Need we say any more? This is Faison Arshad and Chris Fulgar wishing everyone 